guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. Well, it's true that Mackie and Judd have Minnesota sports flowing through their veins, but somebody else who has not just Minnesota sports, but scoops flowing through his veins, our friend Darren Doogie Wolfson, Channel 5 Eyewitness News, Scoop Podcast, Score North, a man of many hats, a man of many beats, a man who knows what's going on. It's Declan, it's Judd, it's Dukes. All right, Dukes, so let's start here. NBA draft on Thursday. Timberwolves have a second round pick, uh, but yet there's always scuttlebutt. So what NBA related Wolves scuttlebutt can you give us today? Well, happy hump day. Hello, Judd. Hello, Declan. Thank you for the flexibility. Blame Adrian Heath. Blame Reynoso. I was over at United to practice yesterday. They kept going and going and going. By the way, I would not be shocked if Reynoso is back in the starting lineup this weekend when they play the team from Salt Lake. On the Wolves, certainly they have made inquiries about moving up from 53, acquiring a first-round pick. But more often than not, the cost of doing that business is a future first round pick. Mm. I've been saying for a while, of course, the Wolves, they literally wouldn't be doing their jobs. Tim Connolly would not be doing his job if he's not talking to other front offices. The Wolves did their diligence on some lottery type prospects, some lower level first round prospects at the Combine in Chicago a month ago. So sure. There is always interest in adding a first-round pick. The beauty of having a first-round pick who performs is, hey, look at the money, right? When trying to navigate a salary cap, if you can have a high level or at least a rotational player for years one, two, and three of their contract, that is a beautiful thing. So, of course, the Wolves have spoken with Houston, Indiana, Brooklyn, Utah, right? You look at the teams that have multiple first-round picks. Indiana is willing to move one of their lower ones. Houston is willing to move pick 20. But I just can't find a logical match where the Wolves can pull it off. But sure, they've at least planted some seeds. But I would be very surprised if in the end, come Thursday night, tomorrow night, if the Wolves actually land one of those picks. But yes, there clearly is interest. The other scuttlebutt, I'm bearing the lead to this back and forth, is I'm led to believe just like last summer, just like, hey, a couple years ago, that the Wolves have legit interest in Tyus Jones of the Memphis Grizzlies. His name is out there. Now, will Memphis ultimately even move Tyus? Why would they, right? Maybe they think, hey, we can't keep him long term in a contract year. Okay, let's cash him out, but Ja Morant, 25-game suspension, Tyus, you would think, slides seamlessly into that starting point guard job. Why would Memphis move Tyus? Well, I'm led to believe that Tyus is very open to a new situation, so maybe it's driven by the Tyus camp. All I know is the Wolves are fans of Tyus Jones. You hear his name in trade circles. I just don't know though, Judd, much like, you know, the difficulty of, of pulling off a trade for a first round pick. How exactly are you pulling off a Tyus Jones trade more in terms of how are you trumping what other teams can offer? I absolutely can see, especially if the Tyus camp pushes it enough that Memphis does ultimately make a move on Tyus, but how exactly are the Wolves trumping what other teams could offer? Dukes, what, what about the, does the organization still have, uh, does this Tyus Jones, I should say, does he still have fans in this organization? I mean, obviously I know Glenn Taylor has still been here, but you know, it's different coaching staffs to a degree and whatnot. Uh, does he still have fans in the organization that are still big fans of Tyus Jones himself? Absolutely, Declan. I mean, there's still some holdovers from the Gerson Rosas regime, but just go back to last summer. Like the Wolves couldn't find a D'Angelo Russell trade this time last year, but if they could have, There was genuine interest in Tyus Jones one year ago, right? So that would be this current regime. So yes, he has had fans here for a really long time. Now, would you entertain the idea at all of moving a combination of Torian Prince plus Mike Conley Jr.? That would bring you back Tyus plus salary filler. Maybe somebody like Luke Kennard, 
for example, right? Would you do that deal? If you were Minnesota, you move Mike Conley Jr., you move Torian Prince, you bring back Tyus Jones, you bring back somebody like Luke Kennard. Would you do that deal if you're Minnesota? And is that the best possible return that Memphis could net? But my understanding is Memphis absolutely is interested in a wing. Don't necessarily know on Torian, but in a wing, if they do ultimately move Tyus, plus they do need to solve those 25 games when John Morant will be out. So as far as that goes to Dukes, what's your sense or what is the buzz about Conley? So is Conley, because I mean, he is definitely a stabilizing player, um, but he's not a young man. He, you know, he misses time. Do you think that the odds are good that Conley is here at the start of the 2023-24 season? Or to what you just said, do you think that there's a decent chance that Tim Conley says, hey, appreciate what you did. You know, you came here, definitely provided a good influence, but that the Wolves do move him. I think they are open-minded, right? I mean, Mm. they're married to Anthony Edwards, right? Like, we know Anthony Edwards isn't going anywhere. Right. Right? I mean, there's other players. Jada McDaniels isn't going anywhere. I would not say that Mike Conley Jr. is untouchable, especially if the return was a starting caliber point guard like Tyus Jones that is younger, right? So I wouldn't necessarily dismiss the idea. Now, Conley Jr.'s contract is interesting. If you're going to trade him, you would do it, heck, in the coming days because of the partial guarantee. Like, that full guarantee kicks in in a few days. I forget the exact number, but If a team wanted to do some creative stuff, you would acquire Mike Conley Jr. in the next 24 to 48 hours, then do something with that contract because it is not fully guaranteed for the 23-24 season. So by chance, if we see Mike Conley Jr. move on, I would imagine it happens this week, not later Mm. in the summer. Interesting. Dukes, I saw Shams tweet out that the uh, salary cap is actually currently projected to be at $134 million this year. That's about 10.4 higher than last year, and actually it's even a little higher than projected. I know with teams like the Wolves and other ones who are near that luxury tax lane, I got to imagine as much cushion and room as possible makes life a lot easier for filling out that roster and handing out a bunch of money too. Yeah, I don't know about a lot easier, Declan, but you'll take whatever they're willing to to offer. So yes, those numbers just came out here on Wednesday morning, a little bit higher than projected by a couple million or so, not like significantly higher, but certainly higher. Now this has no impact on Cats, Supermax, or the max extension that Anthony Edwards will sign. Could eventually, but those contracts kick in for the 24-25 season. So it's possible, okay, the cap just jumped significantly now, that the cap stays flat for the 24-25 season, or maybe only goes up a little bit. So I was just texting with Bobby Marks, in fact, right? He's my go-to on, on cap mm-hmm. questions. So I said, yeah. hey, is there any sort of presumption? Yeah, how about that for a name drop? How about, you know, just any sort of presumption that because the cap jumped a bunch now, that it will have a comparable jump one year from now, thus impacting Cat's extension, Anthony Edwards' extension, Bobby thinks right now, no, that he could see the cap staying flat or only spiking just a little next year, that this big jump isn't necessarily meaning that a big jump is also going to happen one year from now. So that'll be interesting, though, this time next year, seeing what the 24-25 cap is when talking about Cat's extension kicking in, Anthony Edwards' extension kicking in. And do the TV contracts, the national TV contracts, expire in a couple of years? Because I think that's where you're going to get your next mammoth jump. Um, I want to say that I'd have, have to look that up. I can't tell you on the local front, though. The Wolves still have a contract with, as of now, right. Valley Sports North, or I guess it would be what the Sinclair Group. Yeah. Three more years, right? So the Twins is expiring. Yeah. I don't know what the Wilds is. I should look up or reach out to find out. But I can tell you that the Wolves have three more seasons left starting next season. So one, two, and three, three more seasons of, of a contract with the Sinclair Group. In- interesting. I uh, Dukes. On Nas Reed, so um, if I'm to understand this correctly, you guys showed up for some workout access that the Wolves had this week at some point in time, and lo and behold, who's there working out and watching Nas Reed, 
who is about to hit unrestricted free agency, which led a lot of pe people to say, whoa, he's here. And, and I know he works his ass off. Uh, but that being said, what's your best gut feeling or what ha have you heard about him? Because obviously he'd be great to keep around. But I got to think, as currently constructed, the Wolves roster doesn't necessarily offer the best opportunity. And a lot of teams are going to come calling with a lot more playing time to give Nas Reed, who I think clearly deserves it at this point. Yeah, I mean, at this point, if you're Nas, if you're his agent, Sean Kennedy, like you have every incentive to get to, it's not even July 1st. It's like five or six o'clock central on June 30th. Okay. So nine days from now, like why wouldn't you get to free agency doesn't mean you can't re-sign with the Wolves, but why wouldn't you listen to what other teams are pitching, including a lot more playing time, including a starting job? But make no mistake about this. Nas, in fact, I'm told, has been here in Minnesota just about the entire offseason. Like, you know, playoffs end against Denver. He's been here. Maybe he took a trip here or there. But, like, this is home base. He's been at Mayo Clinic Square a lot the last few weeks. Now, I don't necessarily think he's playing a whole lot of three on three or five on five, like being super active. Sure. Getting his work in, but he needs to be cautious. Right. Plus he's coming back from an injury anyway. Right. So there's still some rehab involved with that, but like, he's not going to overexert himself heading into free agency, putting his body on the line, but yes, his presence there on Monday, we were over there on Monday for some Gabe Kausher access from D La Salle high school, the former gopher, former Iowa State Cyclone. So he was among prospects to work out for the Wolves on Monday. So while there, sure, across the gym, I saw Rudy Gobert. I saw Nas Reed. I saw Josh Minot, Wendell Moore Jr., Luke uh, Garza, Jordan McLaughlin. I'm leaving out a name or two. Then Carl Anthony Towns put on his Instagram on Monday night, a workout at Mayo Clinic Square. Then the Wolves put on their social media on Tuesday. Anthony Edwards, a lob pass to Rudy Gobert. So a lot of guys, not every guy, but a majority of guys are in town this week for workouts. I'll tell you what, yes, the facility helps, right? Guys love Mayo Clinic Square. But guess what? If you go back to the Tom Thibodeau regime, it was Mayo Clinic Square. I don't recall even one guy being in town, maybe one or two, but it was pretty minute. You know, guys being in town in late June under Tibbs, for workouts. So certainly from that standpoint, you know, things have shifted where guys really thoroughly enjoy being here in the months of June and July. Uh, twin scoops, Stugs, what do you got for us on the baseball front? I know they've been struggling a little bit. Uh, I, I saw Ball, Rocco Baldelli about losing his patience and frustration naturally. So yesterday in post game, uh, what can you tell us on the twins front? Yeah. I mean, a little bit Declan, right? I mean, <laughs> third worst record in the American league since May 1st, only better than Oakland, lowly Oakland, and Kansas City, lowly Kansas City. So really, from May 1 on, the better part of the last seven weeks, it's more than a little bit. But hey, you know, multiple guys told me, I was in the clubhouse yesterday, multiple guys, because I just said, hey, we're a couple games from approaching the halfway point of the season. So I just said, it was an open-ended question, what stands out to you about the first half of the season. A couple guys told me unprompted, hey, we're still in first place, but also acknowledging, you know, this roller coaster, especially of late, how bad they've been playing. I'll tell you one thing I gleaned yesterday being in the clubhouse. I really, really sense that Byron Buxton is ready to play some center field. Maybe not nine innings, maybe not four times or six times a week, but that he's ready to make that transition to the outfield. He got some work in on Monday. Now, Rocco Baldelli went on the record Tuesday pregame when pressed by our good friend Chip Scoggins of the Star Tribune that Byron isn't physically ready to play the field. I'm just telling you, my sense is, maybe this fits more under the Reckless Speculation Thursday umbrella. We can bring this up again tomorrow when Phil Mackey joins the conversation. I assume Phil will join unless he's on vacation, but we can go deeper on this on Thursday when I rejoin you guys. But like my sense is Byron is ready to play in the field. So I just don't know why the twins are holding him back at this point. I need to dig deeper on that. But I'm just telling you, I feel confident putting it out there that I sense that Byron, if you called upon him, he would love to be out in center field for some period of time. 
two things that seem weird off of that, um, Dukes, is one, on Sunday, if I'm not mistaken, when Buxton pinch hit and was called out uh, for the third for the third strike, third out, bases loaded, the Twins could have made a, a switch there and could have put Buxton in center field, but they actually got rid of the DH altogether and Moran was in the lineup. The second thing is what Rocco said on Tuesday is being spun like this is consistent with what he said. But it's not. This was far stronger. He said he physically can't play out there. Before every comment c- came off as we're being smart and cautious, which I which I had no problem with. I thought when Chip pressed him, though, the comment came off far stronger of no, he can't play because he basically said we would play him out there. So if this is true, what you're saying, that is really interesting because that goes from being uh, we're just being cautious to you know, Buxton, if he feels he's set to play out there and him being told you can't play out out there, this takes it to a very weird place that I would say this. We have not been, at least from a from what we know publicly, um, a standpoint that we have not been at until now. You're right. I mean, I acknowledge what Rocco said yesterday was stronger than what they've offered up going back weeks. I don't know if they just feel like, hey, if we put him out there, then he does get hurt. How much scrutiny do we then get, right? How much will we be ripped, right? Is there a right answer? I mean, they feel like, most importantly, we need his bat in the lineup, even though I get it. You know, homework last night, so hopefully that snaps him out of this funk. But 0 for 24 overall, the numbers, especially since he took that pitch to the ribs, the numbers just aren't good. But they feel like, His best asset is the bat, not the defense. But you just think about who else they could put in that DH slot. I'd love to see Matt Walner up, right? I mean, I would DFA Max Kepler today. I would call up Matt Walner, who hit today another 425-foot home run with an exit velo of 109 miles per hour. The guy is wasting his time in his mid-20s. Right. Wasting his time. Why? Why? At Triple I'm not suggesting that Matt Walner is some sort of savior, but Matt Walner needs to be in the Twins lineup tonight. It just doesn't make sense to me. Get him up here, right? So you could, you know, if you wanted to, DH Walner, right? It just it gives you more options if the DH spot is open, if Buxton can play center field. And hey, it's not a knock on Michael A. Taylor, who I think has been for what you expected, he's met that bar or even exceeded that bar since coming in the trade with Kansas city, but I just, I need to dig further Judd, but I'm with you. I think it opens up a new can of worms. Rocco's comments on Tuesday. And I'm just telling you my senses when Buck offered up to us that he got some work in on Monday, some of the frustration where he's still trying to battle. Okay. You know, you get in that bat, you know, in Buck's case, a lot of strikeouts of late, right? Strikes out. Then not being able to go out to the field and focus on, defense right that he sits in the dugout and he starts just mind bleeping himself right you know i'm paraphrasing there he didn't use those words right but that it's still a process on adjusting to being a dh where you go back you go underneath maybe get in the cage do some stuff but is he acknowledged hey hitting off a pitching machine compared to hitting off a real pitcher completely different that he's still adjusting to what he does in between at-bats when not being able to play in the field. I'm just telling you, Judd, my strong sense is he thinks he's physically able. You watch him run, even though he hasn't had a chance to run very often the last couple weeks, but you watch him run just the eye test. Judd, you watch him run, you mean to tell me he would be lost or however you want to phrase it if he's playing in center field? He looks physically ready to me, eye test to play in center field. So I th- I think the problem is this, though. To go back to last June, it, it's weird. I, f- I feel like May and June is Twins truth serum time. Like, they finally come clean. If you go back to last spring around this time, that's when Baldelli said, and I think it's always when he gets a little bit frustrated because the questioning continues, he has a chronic knee condition. I don't think it's he can't run. I think they're literally afraid if he stands out there in the outfield and the pounding that that knee takes. Like, I came away from the comments I read yesterday saying he's done out there. Like, they think he's done out there. 
So if, well, so what? I so mean, what you're right saying now. is I mean, really interesting. I don't think there's any sort of plan anytime real soon. Now, I mean, I don't want to like make some sort of grandiose prediction about August 30th or something like right. that, right? Right. But like in the immediate future, Judd. I mean, it's clear as day. I mean, you just said it on Sunday, right? When you lose the DH, when he could have gone out there for an inning, right? right? Or maybe you're hoping to prolong that game into extra innings, but. A couple innings, three innings, right? Like we weren't asking for nine innings yep. on Sunday. The fact they didn't make that move on Sunday tells us all we need to know. But the question, the rebuttal is, are they right with this, right? Who is right? That my sense is Buck feels like, hey, he could play out there. But the Twins are saying, okay, we need his bat more than anything. Would there be wear and tear from him standing out on that knee? for nine innings or seven innings, whatever it is, right? I don't know. I don't have the answer on that. I'm just telling you from my point of view, it would help a struggling lineup mm -hmm. to have some DH options mm -hmm. that my sense is he could give you something out there. Interesting. Deco? Dukes, on the reliever front, I know the bats have been the story, and rightfully so, um, but that bullpen still has to get sewn up a little bit. Jorge Lopez now going on the mental health list. And with them trying to patchwork that bullpen last year, it just feels like as much as they want, if they want to plant seeds and make trades at the deadline, which I know they've, you know, had maybe initial dialogue already, even though we're six weeks from the trade deadline, I feel like they're walking this interesting rope where yes, they have to fix the bullpen, but at what cost, you know, like how, how much, how much farther down do they want to go with giving up mid tier prospects just to fix a position that is very volatile and honestly might not even save their season. Well, it may not, but, you know, you add a guy or two, Declan, you know, that helps you that much more to win the weakest division in baseball to get back to the playoffs. Then take your chances in a small sample size of a first round series. Then who knows? Go from there, right? Or in the Twins case, I think for me, the bar is just end the 18 game playoff losing streak. I'm not even asking for them to win that first round series. It would be nice, right? But just to me, find a way to win one playoff game, not necessarily a series. It's not like the cost is going to be through the roof, right? Like a Raldis Chapman, right? So the Twins have planted a seed with Kansas City. There's some level of interest in a Raldis Chapman. What are you giving up, Declan? Prospect 17, 16, 15. I'm sure the Royals are holding out for a little bit more. But for a rental, a reliever rental, the cost should not be crazy. Like the Twins can go trade for a reliever. Or even two. The issue right now is there are still some teams, the Cardinals, the Cubs, I can list some others, that are still trying to figure out, are they in it or are they not in it? The White Sox, right? I mean, right now the White Sox are, what, four and a half games back? The White Sox stink. Some of it is injury in it. reasons. But, like, if you're the White Sox, you probably need to look at it and say, we're in it. Why wouldn't we be in it? So I'm just saying there are so many teams, not the Royals, okay, not the A's if you wanted a return of Trevor May, right? So there are some teams that are very, very clear sellers, but there are other teams still on the fence that the Twins are going to have to wait this thing out a bit longer. Final scoop, sir. Well, speaking of the Twins, the draft combine going on right now in Phoenix. So the Twins have a chance to watch some guys work out then more so just sit down with guys for interviews. The Twins have 16 representatives, including medical staff, all that, but a number of scouts, including scouting boss Sean Johnson. So the Twins heavily, heavily represented at this week's draft combine in Phoenix. The best local prospect there is a Gophers pitcher by the name of George Klassen. He threw it 100 miles per hour yesterday. So well, he doesn't have a whole lot of experience. Had Tommy John a couple of years ago. He has started for the Gophers, right? But doesn't have a whole lot of college experience. But when you can throw it, heck, 101 or even 102, yeah. right? That's very appealing to scouts. So he would be the local name to keep an eye on. The MLB draft begins on July 9th. The Twins have the fifth pick overall. The top prospect in Phoenix this week is a high school outfielder from Indiana by the name of Max Clark. Not sure he gets to five. He very well could go pick three or pick four, but he very much is on the Twins' radar. Awesome stuff, Dukes. We'll talk to you Thursday again, okay? Okay, sounds good, boys. I'll tell you tomorrow about my conversation with this new Gophers basketball player from Lithuania. Remind me, I'll tell you about that tomorrow. Sure. Nice. All right, thank you. Okay, see you, boys. See ya.